Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Funk Lecture Series on Biogeography. I'm Karen Fowler from the International Biogeography Society, and we have a few other open access things that you can check out uh, while either before or after, well, after the talk, not during the talk. Um, Frontiers of Biogeography is our uh, journal for the society, and we have a new issue coming out next week. And these are some activities that are coming up mostly in the fall or early next year. So International Humboldt Day, we did our first instance of, of that last year, which was, it was a great series of events uh, from all around the world. And we're gearing up to uh, help coordinate that again this year. So I encourage you to check out the website and think about hosting a, a, an event for that. And then we have two conferences coming up. One is in Amsterdam this October, and the other is in Vancouver in January of 2022, and both should be, I'm super excited about actually going to these conferences. Um, and with that, I think I will turn it over to Crystal, who will introduce our guest speaker for today. Hi, everybody. Um, so thank you for showing up for our seventh installment of the Vicky Funk Lecture Series. Um, Vicki Funk was a past president of the International Biogeography Society, and she passed away in 2019. So we've dedicated this series of lectures in her honor, in her uh, memoriam. And we are so excited today to have Jessica Boyce give this lecture. Um, Jessica has a long um, history in the Biogeography Society. I think we may have actually met in IBS many years ago. Um, but she did her bachelor's at University of California in San Diego. Um, she went on to do her master's at Humboldt State University in California, and then did a PhD at University of California, San Diego. At that point, Jessica went on to do postdocs at um, University of Wisconsin at the Center for Climate Research up until 2013. And then she took on an assistant professor position at University of California, Merced. Her research that I followed for years spans a multitude of things from phylogenetics to paleoecology. And I think that maybe one of the summing things that would encompass all of her research is that she looks at pattern and process across space and through time, just super broad. So I'm really excited to see what, what we have today, Jessica. Thank you. Um, thanks for that introduction, uh, Dr. McMichael, and thank you to everybody that's here on the call. Um, I'm really excited to be part of the Funk Lecture Series, and I really appreciate the organizers of, um, of the lecture series uh, for, for keeping us connected during, uh, during the past year. So today, I'm going to be focusing on work that I've been doing over the last uh, several years uh, with my lab, um, both students and postdocs, where we're trying to understand the spatiotemporal patterns of species and community change, um, and prim primarily within California or the West. And so we've been focusing on building a picture of the California small mammal community and the different factors at play in their evolutionary and ecological histories. And so. Um, I'll be maybe highlighting a, a few different uh, approaches um, that I take, but again, following from Dr. McMichael's introduction, focusing on um, change across space and change through time. Okay. So um, in many ways, and like many biogeographers, many people in the audience here, um, the key unifying theme to all of my work is a focus on change. And um, at times I focus on uh, change along uh, spatial gradients. And let me see if I can get my, um, my pointer here. Let's do this. Um, and at other times I focus on uh, change over temporal uh, scales or temporal gradients. And um, my work tends to focus uh, or primarily focus on change uh, across temporal scales. Um, and I typically work um, on time scales of thousands of years, on millennial scales, um, but depending on the approach I'm using, sometimes I uh, infer changes over longer evolutionary time periods. And so this is a really complicated figure that I have showing. Um, it's, it's a work from a, a relatively recent, uh, or maybe a couple years old um, review paper that was led by Gio Rapacciolo, a former postdoc at UC Merced, who I had the good fortune to work with. Um, and who I think is now started a new position with NatureServe. 
Um, and I won't be able to go through all the details here. You can um, look at, you know, read the paper and um, talk to me or, or Geo later. Um, but I think it sums up a lot of my research goals and the really the puzzle that I'm trying to piece together for California mammal biodiversity. And so we were building off the rich history of community assembly work and in particular the work of Mark Belland um, to synthesize different processes um, that influence community change across space and time. And so in this talk uh, today, I'm gonna be presenting two vignettes that um, capture different portions of this space-time diagram. And so the first uh, vignette I'll talk about is uh, demographic history and spatial dynamics. And so this is um, focusing on uh, lineage dynamics, evolutionary history, um, and I'm going to be honing in uh, not on the whole mammal community, but on uh, or whole mammal assemblage in Western North America, but really um, focusing on two different uh, species, Paramiscus maniculatus, the deer mouse, and Neotoma fuscopes. And this work is led by my graduate student, um, uh, Dr. Robert Boria, who just finished his PhD uh, this May. Um, and I think he's here in the audience um, uh, for uh, to if you wanna you know, chat with him or, uh, afterwards. Um, and then the second um, project or vignette that I'll talk about is um, really focusing in on the assemblage level and honing in on a particular locality and how um, the community or the assemblage at that locality has changed through time and the processes that um, are driving or underlie those community changes. And I'm gonna, probably use the word community a lot um, throughout this talk. Um, it's most accurately described as an assemblage, um, but I'll, I'll use the two interchangeably here. Um, and this work uh, at uh, uh, Samuel Cave, um, this particular locality that I'm focusing on, the work I'm gonna highlight today is led by uh, Dr. Eric Williams, who finished in my lab a few years ago. Um, and at the end, um, we'll talk about sort of the next steps in, in this sort of locality-based um, picture. Um, and so overall, you know, focusing on two really different scales um, and these two different scales uh, require different approaches. Um, and so to get started, we're gonna focus on demographic history and spatial dynamics of these two important small mammal uh, species. And uh, this will be based on a contemporary molecular demographics approach. Um, I wanted to highlight, um, so the work on Paramiscus maniculatus is still in progress. Um, Rob's leading that up right now. And um, the work on Neotoma fuscopes was done in collaboration. It was started by a former postdoc in my lab, Sarah Brown, um, and myself, uh, Rob, really took over the project and, and uh, developed it and, and owned it. Um, and then we were uh, really fortunate to work with Marjorie McCoke at University of Nevada, Reno, one of the, you know, or not one of the, the world's expert in, in this uh, particular species. And so there was a paper published just earlier this year on that describing this work. Okay, and um, it's only a 25 minute talk. There's a lot of information to distill down. Um, basically all of Rob's dissertation in um, half of 20 minutes. And so Rob, don't kill me for describing your work in, in you know, a few slides, but um, I'm gonna gloss over a lot of the methods and just focus on our key results. Um, and so um, we can talk about any details uh, that I might miss or that you want more details of later. But, um, and there were differences in the two projects, but there, I'm gonna really try to focus on the common themes that emerged from them or the common questions we answered with them. Okay, so what we were trying to understand is how many populations and lineages are there within each species? Um, you know, what was the most likely demographic history of each species and how did they shift uh, through time? Um, and in particular, this um, project, which is maybe not quite as relevant to the story I'm building in the talk today was trying to um, really uh, hone in on their likely uh, Pleistocene refugia and really understand um, using a combination of different approaches, um, how uh, the, the distributions of these two species and the genetic diversity has shifted across the landscape. And so um, to do this, we assembled RADSEQ data um, for each of these uh, species or, or lineages. Um, we determined population structure, the number of, of um, groups within each uh, species. Um, we inferred phylogenetic trees to see how individuals clustered genetically. Um, 
we're not, we don't have a, a ton, or we don't have really, um, we're, we're, we don't have a sort of enough resolution to look at relationships among individuals. We're really just using the phylogenetic trees to um, see if the same clusters of individuals are um, recovered from a phylogenetic approach versus a um, sort of a structure-based approach. Um, we then, um, you know, knowing sort of a bit about the, the genetic structure of the of each species, we were trying uh, interested in using a coalescent based approach to probe uh, to determine which was the most likely sort of demographic history or most well supported demographic history for each species. And then finally, once we had that um, in depth picture of um, of the dynamics and demographics that are driving or influencing the, each species through time, we wanted to understand um, how they shifted it or how they likely shifted across the landscape um, over, um, over their evolutionary histories and where their likely refugia were. And so we were using ENMs, uh, combining ENMs with uh, genetic data to, to look at that. Okay, so um, fast and furious methods. Um, Okay, so getting straight to the results for this, um, we for I'm showing here a series of slides. So um, you have the um, key question that we're trying to answer um, at the top: How many populations or lineages were present within each species? Um, I'm trying to show, uh, or I am showing, Neotoma fuscopes on the left and Paramyscus municulatus on the right, um, and. Um, in both cases, you can see that three different groups or populations were recovered. Um, the scale uh, at which we, uh, the spatial scale at which we were inferring these groups uh, varied uh, quite um, dramatically uh, between the two species. Um, Neotoma fuscopes is a species that is found primarily or located today primarily in California, a little bit up into Oregon. It has a closely related sister species um, in the rest of California down into Baja. Um, Paramiscus municulatus is a very broadly distributed species. We're just focusing in on uh, lineages in the western part of the species distribution. It's the most, you know, one of the most common mammals in North America, um, you know, called, sometimes called the Drosophila of mammalogy. Um, and so that's, you know, just the first thing to note is that spatial scale difference here. Um, and you can see that in uh, Neotoma fuscopes, um, there's uh, the first split is the split between the southern uh, population and these two northern populations. Um, so the two northern populations are up here, southern population here. That break is somewhere around San Francisco Bay. Um, and then there is a, a split between, a well-supported split between the two northern populations as well, but it's much more recent as we'll see. Um, Paramiscus municulatus is a is a much more complex picture. This is a um, been a tricky uh, species uh, or species complex really to work with. We're just focusing on two of the western lineages. Um, you can see that the um, uh, tree is not very well supported. There's a few well supported clusters within there, and you know it's probably hard to see this at the resolution of this slide, but. Um, um, this is really similar, um, this sort of complex uh, lack of resolution is really similar to what many other researchers have found within this um, group. So there's a, a very well-supported Pacific Northwest um, group, and then what we are calling the Northern group, this um, in yellow here, um, ranging from, um, you know, throughout the Western US, uh, bit trending North in the Western US up um, to um, sort of Northern, Ish Canada, and then there's the southern group in blue here. Um, and so, in both cases, we're recovering, um, you know, populations, uh, three different populations. And so, the question, uh, next question we had was sort of how um, distinct or when did these populations originate? When were this um, sort of divergence events within um, within these uh, two species? And so, for this, we used this coalescent based approach. Um, uh, where we um, uh, laid out different scenarios of how these three groups were potentially related to one another in each species, um, which then governed or dictated the um, timing of divergence. Uh, and we tried to, um, and then we sort of turned on and off whether migration was allowed um, between groups. And in some of the work for Maniculatus, we also looked at, um, we allowed uh, or simulated um, population expansions. And we were testing to see which, um, 
which scenario was most strongly supported or consistent with the data that we have. And so in this case, um, here's again, Fuscopes on the left and uh, Paramiscus on the right. Um, and you can see uh, two things. Um, one, um, the most strongly supported uh, uh, scenario um, was consistent with the, the phylogenetic trees we inferred um, with uh, the sort of in, in Fuscopes, Neotoma Fuscopes, these two north groups being more closely related um, and sister to uh, the southern group. Um, and uh, in uh, Paramiscus, it's the northern and southern um, group relate more closely related to one another um, and distinct uh, from the Pacific Northwest group. One thing to note is that just as there were differences in uh, spatial scale, um, there's also really big differences in the temporal scale of these divergence events. And so Fuscopes, um, in, in this case, has uh, the sort of the more expanded or the longer evolutionary history here. Um, so it uh, that split between the North and South group within Fuscopes was estimated to be uh, 1.7 million years ago. Um, and then the North uh, A and North B split, the split between the two Northern populations was more recent, 76,000 years ago. Um, Paramiscus maniculatus, these particular lineages we're focusing on um, have a history of much more recent uh, population divergence events. Again, consistent with um, the difficulty that we had in, in resolving uh, the different groups. And so that um, earlier split of Pacific Northwest uh, group uh, from the Northern and Southern group uh, happened about 158,000 years ago. And then this North-South uh, split happened about the same time as this uh, split within Fuscopes uh, 78,000 years ago. So, um, Again, really big differences in uh, temporal, the demographic history of these uh, two species, um, mainly involving the, the timelines over which each is um, diversifying in the Western US, in California. And then finally, um, we wanted to understand how species shifted through time and where their likely refugia were. Um, and so again, Neotoma fuscopes on the left and Paramiscus maniculatus on the right. Um, and so with fuscopes, um, because that divergence between North and South was so deep, um, we modeled uh, the Northern uh, population or two groups uh, separately from the Southern group, but um, here's an um, Maxent ENM um, built for the species based on the present day. We've hindcasted it to the last glacial maximum to get um, to sort of capture the bounds of warm versus cool uh, time periods over their evolutionary history. And so you can see that um, in the northern, the northern group really doesn't find a lot of suitable habitat at all um, at the LGM, whereas the southern group, um, that suitable habitat largely overlaps its uh, contemporary distribution. And so there was much greater st um, environmental stability um, in that southern population. Um, and with Paramiscus maniculatus, this is a very broadly distributed species. We're just modeling the uh, set of localities um, that we're um, looking at in, in, our, in our paper um, or our project. So focusing again on, on these several lineages within the Western US. Um, and you can see that um, you know, there's uh, projected to be um, suitable habitat um, in the far, sort of southern part of the US, um, northern Mexico at the LGM. And then it's can't see it at the scale I'm presenting it here, but um, potentially some suitable habitat right along the coastline here. Um, and, uh, you know, in this case, uh, Hermiscus likely refugia potentially down here in, you know, anywhere here in the south, and then also potentially up here in um, that Pacific Northwest um, region. So, um, you know, what, what does this all mean? Um, you know, we focused here on two important mammals in Western US communities. Um, they have um, very different histories, um, but overall we see um, these dynamic shifts through time that likely impacted local assemblages quite substantially, thinking about how those species are shifting across the landscape. Um, they're bringing different lineage histories with them as they shift. Um, they're, you know, maybe, um, extirpated um, from local areas, um, recolonized local areas, depending on where those areas are through time. 
And um, just to sort of give a little plug for the excellent work of my graduate student, Rob, uh, Dr. Boria will be starting uh, an NSF postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard University um, this summer, working with Scott Edwards and Hopi Hoekstra. And he'll be extending his work with Panaspis Municulatus um, starting this. So stay tuned um, for more really excellent work from Rob. Um, but overall, um, you know, maybe to go back to the conclusions from this a little bit and connect it with where we're going. Um, when I look at this data, I see complex spatiotemporal lineage dynamics that are occurring, you know, primarily I'm focusing in now on Northern California. Um, and so this is the data that we um, just presented, but focused in on, on Northern California. You can see that, especially for paramiscus with such a big, broad view, we don't have a, the great, we don't have great sampling resolution within California. But in both cases, um, the Bay Area emerges, uh, sort of this Bay Area, Northern um, Central Valley region emerges as a really important region um, in these two uh, small mammal species, um, small mammal, um, you know, com important components of the small mammal community. Um, this is really consistent with um, work that was done a while ago by Leslie Risler and colleagues um, focusing on lineage breaks within um, uh, the herpetofauna of California. And so um, this is a really wonderful paper um, looking at sort of um, phylogeography, phylogeographic lineages, co-distributed species, um, and um, you can see that um, in, in many species in California, that Bay Area emerges, the Bay Area emerges as an important phylogeographic break. And so we're recovering that um, view in, in the small mammals as well. Um, you can also see that there's a region up here um, at the northern end of the Central Valley that appears to also be a really important region. Um, this is also a region where, let me find my mouse here, um, where, uh, um, California switches from the hot, dry Central Valley um, grassland landscape up to the um, sort of Southern Cascades, you know, Northern Sierra petering out, um, Klamath Siskiyou region, so more high elevation, mountainous, cooler um, region. And um, I'm particularly interested in this region because um, there's a nice locality, a fossil locality that I've worked with before that happens to be located right at this region, um, right at this location. So, um, um, and so we wanted to sort of focus in on this region and see, you know, given this um, dynamic set of um, sort of uh, very steep environmental gradients uh, that are occurring in this area that seems to be important uh, in terms of um, evolutionary history of mammal or of, of species in California, um, how are these um, events really um, potentially interacting to influence community change through time? And so um, in this, I'm gonna switch, uh, I'm gonna really switch uh, gears to focus on in now, not on two species and their evolutionary histories, but um, focusing in on one particular location and its ecological um, assemblage history um, over millennia in, um, uh, in time. So uh, this is a picture of Samuel Cave. I worked uh, in this cave uh, assembling the small mammal community um, uh, for my dissertation. Um, and so I was able to document a really rich small mammal community that spanned from about contemporary times to 18,000 years ago. Um, we also know from other work, there's a nice megafaunal community in the region. Um, that's, you know, fossils recovered from these caves that date to, um, you know, to the latest Pleistocene. Um, and um, work that I did previously showed that um, the assemblage experienced quite a bit of change through time. So richness decreased with climate warming. So going from um, a high richness uh, or higher richness uh, um, uh, glacial community to a lower richness Holocene community. Um, you know, no small mammals went extinct, but this was driven by local extirpations. And um, in my previous work, I sort of postulated or um, found that uh, diversity, that diversity decrease was coincident with climate warming, um, going from the glacial, uh, last glacier maximum to the interglacial period. Um, community structure also changed very rapidly with warming, and in particular, um, evenness declined very rapidly, coincident with rapid warming at the Bowling Alarod. And this um, uh, rise, this decline in evenness is really consistent with um, 
or driven by the rise of this really generalist species. And so this is the deer mouse or par uh, paramiscus. Uh, we don't know exactly what um, species is present. We think it's uh, maniculatus, but we have more work to do there. But um, so one of these sort of focal taxa that I've been um, thinking about a lot for, for many years now. Um, and so, um, you know, in, in a way, Paramiscus to me is uh, the star of the story here. Um, so it's driving, you know, it's doubling in abundance um, over um, millennia and really changing the structure of the um, resulting small mammal assemblage. And you can sum up the change uh, in the community um, with turnover. And so there are these two peaks or pulses of compositional turnover. And the first pulse at the bowling alarod corresponds to this rise in deer mice. And the second pulse at the end of the Younger Dryas corresponds to local extirpations of um, uh, the Mazama pocket gopher and the uh, mountain beaver. And both are associated with periods of rapid climate warming. And so in my previous work, I've really attributed a lot of the dynamics um, occurring in this assemblage to climate. Um, and I, I think there's good reasons for that. We, um, that's what the data uh, showed. And we know there's a lot of work in a lot of quaternary paleo that um, has shown that climate is really a big driver of assemblage dynamics um, at these millennial timescales in particular. Um, but my graduate student, Eric Williams, wanted to delve into this in more depth and really um, try to tease apart um, um, in much more fine detail, the processes that are underlying community change over thousands of years. And so focusing in on the small mammal community at Samuel Cave. And so to do this, he's really taking a, you know, we're, we're taking this paleoecological um, and modeling based approach here. And so, um, you know, we're, we know, and this is, you know, work from, um, from Steve Jackson and myself from a few years ago, but and, and, and many others, um, that we know that um, climate is likely is one of the important mechanisms um, that underlies community assembly, but there's a lot of other processes um, that are at play here. And, you know, Steve and I, um, you know, characterize these as interaction assembly, environment assembly, and neutral assembly, and that they're all operating um, at all times, right? And the, the question is, um, when are different assembly processes more or less important? Uh, when and at what, what scales? And so um, Eric was really interested in um, delving into this and trying to understand um, sort of the importance of environmental filtering um, or climate-driven dynamics and structuring the community, um, but, or potentially stochastic mechanisms, right? We know that, um, there could just be sort of random changes through time that structure the community. And, um, you know, oftentimes as paleoecologists, my first go-to is climate as a driver, um, but I need to be aware of and try to account for other potential processes here. Um, and so there's environmental filtering, stochastic uh, mechanisms. So we wanted to delve into that. And then the second question was trying to see, can we um, detect any signals of competitive exclusion that might um, be influencing community composition? And our hypotheses where that climate filtering should be uh, predominant during periods of rapid climate change and competition should be predominant during periods of climate stability. And so the way we approached this was um, to create two predicted communities. So we, um, and so again, we have 14 different strata or empirical communities based on the fossil data that capture different time, um, time shots or snapshots of the community through time. Um, and so we based, um, we built, uh, used an um, ensemble S, um, SDM approach to make predictions of what the community would look like if, um, if only climate were driving uh, assembly of the community. And so we, those are the sort of climatically predicted communities. And then we also um, built predictions of what the community would look like if we just drew species at random from the species pool. And then we're calculating the dissimilarity between the predicted community and the empirical community. Um, and so um, when you look at community dissimilarity through time, the climate predictions are that are very, or the climatically, climatically predicted communities are very similar or have a low dissimilarity with the empirical communities. Um, and it's much lower than uh, the dissimilarity of the stochastic predictions. And so overall, the climate predicted communities best, best matched the empirical communities um, in, this, in this work. 
Um, so again, reinforcing this view um, that climate is uh, potentially the main driver of change through time in this assemblage. But what about um, potential effects of competition? Um, the previous analyses um, were unlikely or you know, to perfectly predict community composition. We know that there's you know, species interactions at play, geographic barriers, other kinds of dispersal barriers, um, changes in dispersal ability. There's potentially tap taphonomic issues and working with fossil data. There's model errors we need to account for in um, working with you know, Hindcastle Dustium. So lots of reasons why um, there might be mismatches in, um, in the predicted, climatically predicted communities. Um, but, you know, barring the other potential reason is that there's maybe a mismatch uh, with, uh, between the empirically observed communities and the climatically predicted communities is that um, competition, you know, with a functionally similar species might prevent um, assembly of a species into that community. And so we wanted to really see if this was a possibility. And so um, we took a trait-based approach for this. So for all time periods, we determined the trait space of the empirical community. And so that is, here's a little schematic here. So that's all those points in gray. Um, we then also um, characterized, uh, placed if there was a species that the climate niche uh, or the climate-based SDMs predicted should be in the, in the community, but it was actually absent in the community. We placed that um, species within this functional trait space. And then we looked at how similar that um, incorrectly predicted species was from all other species in the assemblage. And um, our you know, hypothesis was that um, if competition is potentially uh, detectable, it should be um, you know, the species that have really, um, that are um, very functionally similar to species that are already present in the, uh, in the assemblage. Um, and so um, we sort of assembled at all different time periods, what are the um, potential sort of instances of competitive exclusion. Um, again, I don't, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done to really say it's competitive exclusion. It's hard to really tease that out from fossil data, um, but, you know, this is potential, potential competition um, as sort of inferred through, um, you know, really high similarity in uh, trait space. And so we looked at six, we overall, over those 18,000 years, over those 14 different assemblages, found 65 instances of potential competitive exclusion. Um, you know, looking in at the biology of the species, um, 11 of them seemed like they were likely candidates. Um, eight of those through time um, were interactions between um, Sorex or shrews and Neurotrichus. Um, and you know, three of them were interactions between Paramiscus and Zapis. And so um, there's more work to be done. There's possible um, competitive interactions at play here, but um, again, similar to this, you know, with, it's hard to really tease that out with, with fossil data as we were seeing in lots of different contexts. And so um, overall, what we're doing next is this is work funded by a career grant from the National Science Foundation is trying to expand the spatiotemporal scope of small mammal communities um, to really tease apart um, whether, um, you know, if climate is really a major factor, then, um, you know, the regional climate uh, changes through time are going to be really relatively similar in these two locations. There's, of course, differences. Um, um, but uh, they also, these two locations, one here in Sequoia National Park compared with Samuel Cave, have different, um, slightly different evolutionary histories, um, uh, different set of species uh, present, and so potentially different dynamics. And we can start to tease apart that um, regional forcing from large scale climate dynamics with local factors. Um, and so uh, um, this fall, I'll be doing uh, new excavations at a few different. Uh, caves and localities in Sequoia National Park um, with a uh, new master's student, Corey Shaver, and a new PhD student, Raina Warner, and um, a new stellar undergrad that's been working with me, Daniela Alvarado, the past few years. So, um, and so overall trying to, you know, again, connect what are now pretty separate vignettes into this broader, more in -connect, interconnected view of how and why communities change across space and time. Um, you know, we haven't you know, just focusing on a particular lineages and their evolutionary history, 
um, we need to expand out to um, look at the full evolutionary history of the small mammal fauna of the West um, and really try to make those connections of how um, species are filtering out or um, how do we scale from you know, millions of years of evolutionary history down into um, you know, thousands or hundreds of years um, in terms of uh, compositional change through time at a local, um, at one location. Um, and so with that, I'd like to thank uh, the Blois Paleoecology Lab at UC Merced. I featured work from, uh, from these folks, but really it's a really nice, uh, rich group of past and present members that have uh, been uh, really fun to work with over the years. And I also want to thank uh, all the different museums who uh, helped uh, you know, support their natural history collections that supported, have supported our work. Um, as well as the National Science Foundation for funding and Ford Foundation for funding the Rob. So with that, I think we can move to the Q&A portion. Yes, Jessica, thank you so much for such a um, great talk. Uh, David is going to run the Q&A session um, in the chat window and live questions. Thank you. So all the attendees uh, have different ways to interact with Jessica. You have a general comment, please write it on the chat. If you want to ask a question in live, yes, raise your hand and I will try to uh, give you the chance to. And if not, please type your question in the QA box. Mm -hmm. uh, we have already two questions there. So I will ask by reading Jessica, uh, the first one, yeah. Jorge Noriega. Uh, hi, Jorge, is asking or is saying, hi, Jessica, great talk, congratulations. I was wondering what is your perspective about how easy or complex is to move between these different time and, spa and space scales? What would be your recommendation? Is it easier to go from the local to the regional or the other way around? <laughs> uh, a great question, Jorge. Um... I don't find it easy. Um, I find it very complex to move between these different uh, spatial and temporal scales. Um, I, I think it's easy to make it's easier easiest to make connections, you know, from one scale out to the next. Um, it's harder to really um, elegantly traverse the entire, you know, ladder in a way. Um, and so, where did that question go? So um, that's been, um, that's, that's my view. Um, I think that the history of community assembly theory and all the, you know, the struggles or the, the different issues that we have as a, you know, as a discipline or, you know, thinking about the, this question of scaling indicates it's been, a, it's a, it's a challenge and has been and will continue to be a challenge. Um, you know, whether it's easier to go from local to regional or the other way around, I think that depends a little bit on your entry into the field. Um, uh, I tend to think about species, you know, well, and there's different ways of thinking about it, right? Species to community um, and how that um, impacts, uh, you know, sort of spatial and temporal scales. I tend to start with species and build up to a community. Um, so, yeah, I, I tend to maybe code switch. I don't know that I do one, always do one or the other. I don't always start from local and go to regional or start from regional and go down to local. I, I tend to um, bounce around a bit, which is maybe apparent in this talk because the two really different perspectives on uh, small mammals in, in the West. So, yeah. Thanks, Jessica. We have a question yeah. that will be I'm in sure. line by Bruce Butler. Okay, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, I think you can hear me now. In 2019, uh, Robert Bradley came out with his uh, uh, phylogeographic study of Paramiscus maniculatus. And so since I'm interested in California uh, maniculatus, should I start using uh, Paramiscus sonoriensis and Paramiscus gambelii instead of maniculatus? <laughs> yeah. Um... I, I don't know that I could answer that specific question for you. Um, it's paramiscus is super complex and we've been focusing a lot. Um, again, this is a work done with Rob, uh, my grad student, Rob Boria. We've been focusing a lot on the dynamics that are happening up in the Pacific Northwest, um, right? There's new species, uh, paramiscus kenai, potentially this new undescribed species trying to see if, you know, are we recovering um, 
that in our data. Um, and, you know, we don't really have this in-depth sampling at that, that local scale to answer that. So I'm not as familiar with, um, you know, advice for the southern portion of the range. We've been focusing a lot of our work on that sort of Pacific Northwest um, and sort of northern clade dynamics. But, um, yeah, I mean, this was my first foray into paramiscus phylogenetics. And, you know, and it's it's a mess, <laughs> but it's, you know, that's, it's fun, right? That's the fun part of science is trying to resolve these relationships. But I think, you know, looking at the timing of splits within the group, um, you know, is it one species? Is it many different species? Um, they're, you know, it, the, the evolutionary history is so recent, right? This burst of diversification that's happening over several hundred thousand years um, is, what, is what we're finding. And so I think it's, it's always going to be tricky um, to try to resolve those relationships. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. You have a question from Sam. Yep. Can you hear me? You have a question from Sam Sainer. Yes, I can. He's asking answer. if competitive exclusion that you saw in one location over time, also seeing if you look at the contemporary communities over space. Yeah, so that's a great. Um, so uh, that's a great question, Sam. We haven't looked at that yet. Um, um, but I do think that's uh, the logical next step, right? Um, we've delved into a little bit of the biology of the species just to see, you know, in what what traits do they seem to be overlapping in um, uh, based on the ones that we looked at. But I, I think trying to look at the, um, you know, whether these are actually co-occurring and interacting across space to me seems like the logical next step. But, yeah. Thanks, Jessica. So you have a question from Janet Franklin. Mm -hmm. Janet says, great talk. Uh, a curiosity question. Is your group using or planning to use unseen DNA to resolve the paleotaxonomic uncertainty? Yeah, um, another great question. Um, and, and yes, we've started to do that a bit. It's been, um, I would say, that's been the part of my research that's been the most impacted in the past couple of years. Um, by uh, sort of various different constraints, including COVID. Um, so um, we have some preliminary ADNA data from Permiscus, Permiscus from Samuel Cave showing that it's likely Maniculatus. Um, I you know, spent some time in Beth Shapiro's lab a few years ago um, trying to focus or get focus on Neotoma um, to try to look at that, um, which that, that work is more or less on hold at the moment. Um, the other approach, so we are, I am interested in, in using that as a way to resolve the taxonomic uncertainties. The other work that we've been doing, and this is work that is done, I haven't talked about it all today. Um, um, I've been doing work at La Brea Tar Pits in Southern California. And so um, that's a much more, you know, traditional paleontological approach. You can't get ancient DNA out of those specimens. Um, but my graduate student, Nate, former graduate student, Nate Fox, was doing a lot of geometric morphometric work um, with uh, many of these taxa, not paramiscus, but with neotoma and with microtis um, to try to figure out what species were present at, um, at La Brea. And so I think we can take that framework, the geometric morphometric framework that he built and apply it to Samuel K, which we have started to do. That's um, one of the projects for this summer, working in the lab with one of with Daniela, one of the undergraduates. And so, you know, it's not just ancient DNA that we need. We can, we can get that out of these data, but it's also maybe using this um, combined ADNA and morphometric approach. Thanks, Jessica. Now you have a live question by Jonathan Valdez. Hi. Hi. Uh, yeah. Nice to meet you. My name is Jonathan. Uh, nice to meet you. I wanted to congratulate you for, for your talk. Uh, I was really interested on um, um, the fact that you say that probably uh, uh, um, um, predation can predict better how communities be, uh, behave between each other. Uh, and my question goes to uh, how would you, would you do uh, kind of like same research on demographic studies of small mammals, but in the tropics? Because, well, I have the theory that a uh, prediction can explain it better uh, than climate uh, effects because um, a species here are more specific and are more restrained to the same climate all over the year. 
and probably species on the temperate regions can be more plastic. So predation might define better your uh, predictions, but I don't know uh, what advices would you do for someone that is doing this under tropics? Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan, did you say predation? Yeah, or... I, I agree no. that, no, yeah, sorry, competition. Sorry. Uh, okay. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I don't think I talked about predation, yeah. but yeah, yes. Um, yeah. You know, competition, I, you know, I've been, in, there's a number of us uh, in this that have been trying to see, you know, how can you, can you pull out influence of interactions um, writ large on um, using fossil assemblages? Um, and so work I did, um, you know, that was really led by, um, uh, Kate Lyons um, and Nick Gatelli, Kay Berensmeyer through the Smithsonian um, Research Coordination Network uh, over the years and trying to look at um, sort of take a co-occurrence approach. Um, you know, we're doing a bit of a similar approach here. It's not co-occurrence um, strictly or, you know, in that strict sense, but it's, it's really looking at um, the effects of competition as an artifact or, or after controlling for climate, right? And so my, my general framework has been control for climate first. We know that climate impact impacts communities and then you know, look at the residuals to detect um, interactions such as competition. Um, that seems logical to me, but I don't know that that's the best way of detecting it. Um, I think there's potentially other, I, other other ways of doing it. I haven't found a great way because to me, anytime you're working across these millennial scales, you have to account for the impacts of climate and how they're shuffling species across the landscape. So, um, you know, I would predict maybe given that sort of plasticity of uh, more temperate mammals versus the tropics that you should see stronger impacts of interactions in the tropics. But I think that sounds like a great, um, you know, sort of testable question to look at um, uh, because I I haven't really looked, and to me, I haven't really looked at that um, sort of the plasticity versus specialization as a trait um, in one way. I think that's um, potentially a really clever way um, to connect sort of the evolutionary history of species um, to how they assemble into communities. And I mean, I would love it if you could, you know, do that and report back to all of us. Um, I think that would be a really great contribution. So I don't know yeah. if I really answered your question. Thank, I don't yeah, think I have did. a good answer, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, basically you encouraged me for hey, like uh, pushing the question a little bit yeah. more and, yep. and bringing it up. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, we have a question by Ricardo Ojeda. Mm -hmm. He says, you have a nice presentation, and, but he would like to know how do you explain population differentiation in Neotoma? Mm -hmm. Is it because mm -hmm. topography or is it because mm -hmm. uh, fluctuations in climate or is a combination mm -hmm. of them both? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we're still looking into that. There are some, I would, um, I don't know that it's necessarily elevation. I do think that there's some lineages, uh, bear, you know, geographic barriers that emerged in the northern central valley um, over time um, that contributed to differentiation there. Um, you know, look, I, I would like, you know, I don't know that we have the, um, I mean, we had pretty good resolution within Fuscopies um, across space, but um, I think to really get at that question, you would want to look at, um, I think you'd want to really delve into a much more sort of landscape level view of, um, you know, of, uh, of the genetics to get to get that, you know, to really hone in on what the specific breaks are. Um, it's really interesting, right? Because to me, the, the big gap that I, I don't have a good answer for is if the Northern, um, population of Neotoma fuscopies is fully moving south um, during periods, during colder periods, um, and recolonizing the north, which is what the distribution models would suggest, but I don't know is entirely realistic. You know, how is that interacting with the barriers that are there, right? And, you know, if you see this shift south, 
and then they're recolonizing north. Do you have sort of one lineage that's going up towards the Sierra, um, one lineage that's going up towards the coastal? And is that sort of reinforcing or maintaining these um, differences between the northern groups? I think that that's a, you know, trying to do some landscape level simulations um, to try to capture those dynamic histories could be one approach to doing that. But um, I think it's a good question. You know, how are these interacting? Because, you know, when we're hind casting or traditionally when we're looking for refugia, we're looking for refugia at the last glacial maximum as sort of a, an easy snapshot, right? To just capture the, the bound, the boundaries or the, the ends of the spectrum, cold and warm. But that's a, you know, I think we need a much more nuanced view of it because, um, you know, over the time scale, over 1.7 million years of Neotoma Festipes divergence, you know, the times that species are experiencing those coldest climates are really quite short and the times that species are experiencing those warmest climates are really quite short over that scale. And in reality, they're experiencing something, you know, maybe on the cold side, but in between. And so I think we need to really get a more nuanced view of the climatic history and the way that shapes um, range dynamics to, to really answer, you know, to do that question justice. Thanks, Jessica. You are getting many questions here, so I will go for the next one. Okay. The next one is by Pedro Perez Neto. Hi, Pedro. Mm -hmm. uh, Pedro says, great talk, Jessica, thank you. I wonder if you have any thoughts about, opening quotes, optimal designs, mm -hmm. using mm -hmm. quotes, for determining number and location of sites and sampling time. Should we adapt the design in a dynamic way in which we change the design as findings are determined along the way or keep it est estatic? static? Yeah. Um, yeah, hi, Pedro, thanks for the question. Um, I don't know that I have any great insight here. Um, it's something that um, in talking with all of all of my students we've really struggled with um, and you can create the most optimal design um, statistically. And then when you try to pull together the samples either from museum collections or by doing your own sampling, um, you're, you're just not gonna be able to achieve that optimal design. And then you, you know, try to add on maybe um, paleo data to get ancient DNA, for example, and you know, then you're even more limited. So. Um, I don't know that there's ever an optimal design. Um, I mean, I think there is probably a statistically optimal design. I think it depends on the particular question, but whether that, you know, as an ecologist or biogeographer, can we actually ever achieve that optimal design? I don't really have any illusions that we, we will. And so I guess, you know, the approach that I tend to take is to try to and, I, you know, again, it really depends on the question, but to try to sort of do broad scale um, more limited sampling um, to get the maybe the gestalt of things and then um, try to um, flesh out, add on, um, increase sample size as needed. Um, you know, I think depending on some questions for, for the genetics, you need to have, it's helpful to have, you know, some minimum number of individuals so that you can be sure that you're um, sort of reconstructing, um, reconstructing history appropriately. Um, but I've tended to maybe think, okay, here's an interesting place, or here's an interesting pattern that's emerged once you get that gestalt, and then like try to maybe hone in and more sample, more densely sample. Um, I think there's lots of ways of doing it though. But. Thank you, Jessica. You have a question from Adam Smith. This mm -hmm. is a talk regarding traits. They seem inseparable from a species. After all, what is a species mm -hmm. without traits? And yes, mm -hmm. trade seems to have a small explanatory power in the studies of historical and contemporary ranges and in community mm -hmm. history. Any mm -hmm. thoughts why traits don't seem to matter much? Mm -hmm. Are we missing something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question, Adam. Um, it's, you know, and, and to me, I think it's something I, um, I really struggle with um, because I think a lot of the way we approach traits right now is at a coarse, more macro scale. And so really thinking about trait explanations through time, I think you need to look at much longer um, evolutionary histories within groups, right? That um, the difference between maybe Neotoma fuscopes and Neotoma macrotus in trait space is not that different, but the difference between Neotoma and Paramiscus is much larger, right? And so I think to some extent, 
there's a mismatch in the time scales over which you're using trait data. I think we can start to overcome that, but that's a little bit of an artifact of how we collect trait data or how we assign trait data, right? And so we have tended to use species mean trait data, and I think we're moving, especially, um, and I think we're moving towards trying to get more individual level trait data, um, different kinds of trait categories. Um, that's a little harder to do for, with sort of the fossil data I have. Um, if I just have a, a lot of individual specimens of teeth from a fossil locality, you know, there's, uh, I can sort of look at traits in terms of geometric morphometric landmarks, but um, if I wanna, um, you're, you know, it's harder to maybe get uh, the wide variety of traits that you can get from um, going out and collecting specimens on the landscape or species on the landscape, individuals on the landscape today. So um, it's something that I'm really wrestling with. I think many people are wrestling with. There's a really nice new um, uh, trait database called Futures that is um, for, focused on vertebrate data, trying to combine archeological and paleontological data to really get at individual level trait data that I think will at least help from the data side. But um, yeah, I don't know if I have a good answer, but I, that's sort of where I'm thinking. I think uh, what I'm thinking right now, so. We have a live question for you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Jorge. Now you are mute. So no. Hi. <laughs> Sorry. So I was, uh, I was, I was just wondering, Jessica, if if you have any idea of what is happening with functional diversity, and especially functional groups across this time, space, scales. Do you have any idea if they change a lot or or they stay? kind of stable mm -hmm. or something? Mm -hmm. We only have um, functional data at the level of Samuel, or we've only not have, we've only looked at the functional diversity at the level of Samuel Cave right now. I actually thinking about it, um, I don't know that we've specifically plotted functional diversity through time at Samuel Cave yet. I know, I don't know if Marta Jerizna is still on here. I know her um, and uh, former postdoc or current postdoc working with her, we're also looking into functional diversity through time. Um, I'm not sure the status of that work, but um, you know, we see in the compositional data that there is um, compositional change. And oftentimes what we're seeing is that one species is replacing another within the same genus. And so functionally, I think that there's very little community functional change through time over 20,000 years at Samuel Cave. Um, the biggest local extirpation we see that's, um, um, you know, is actually a extirpation of a particular group that's not replaced is with the mountain beaver, Apodontia rufa. That is a really divert, you know, functionally different, evolutionarily distinct uh, species. Um, and so that seems like a more meaningful loss. But when you aggregate that into an overall view of functional diversity, is that changing diversity that much, just the loss of that single species? Probably not, um, but um, that's sort of the most significant change through time. Other times it's just change of species within groups, um, potentially um, like, you know, going from the Mazama pocket gopher to um, bodies pocket gopher. Again, you know, at, at a bigger scale, one pocket gopher is functionally relatively similar to another pocket gopher. They do have differences between them, ecological differences, climatic differences, but, you know, as compared with, um, you know, a ground squirrel or a tree squirrel, right? Those are still relatively more similar, so. Great, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks, Jessica. Yes, the last two questions for you. Uh, mm -hmm. This is an anonymous question. Uh, super great talk, Dr. Jessica. And just curious, what do you think are the pros and cons of using one proxy of competition over another to mm -hmm. distinguish these effects, the abundance of a competitor versus the biomass? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm I'm someone who uh, maybe the paleo perspective. I like to sort of look at as many different proxies as you can because I think each different metric is giving you a slightly different answer, a slightly different view. Um, and so, you know, abundance versus biomass. Um, I, yeah, that's a that's actually a really good question. I think coming down to like energetics, a lot of it might be about biomass, right? If you're trying to um, look at like what's driving, you know, if competition is really coming down to energetics, 
um, and energetic dynamics uh, between species potentially, then biomass might be a better measure than abundance. Um, so you know, it's not so, it's not something that I've thought of a ton, in part because there's a lot of steps to go from abundance in a fossil uh, assemblage up to biomass. But I know that you know other people have really like um, Rebecca Terry and Rebecca Rowe had a really nice paper looking at biomass changes through time um, in small mammal assemblages over the Holocene. So um, to me, I think if you want to connect it with um, competition, that would maybe be the better way of going because of because it's sort of maybe more I'm strongly reflective of energetics. Thanks, Jessica. Okay, mm -hmm. you have your last question. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry for keeping you a bit longer. Mm -hmm. um, I mm -hmm. will read the question. I don't know if Nick Freumuller would like to come with a question live or so. Please, Nick, go ahead. He must be sure. in lab. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Jessica. So, <laughs> yeah, in your Samuel Cave paper, there was the um, there was clearly like a lag in uh, elevated levels of turnover post glacial maximum warning, warming. Yeah. Um, so there's clearly sort of a, a lag between the, the climate forcing and when the community, mm -hmm. you could say, finally equilibrates. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that mm -hmm. there's there's some pollen work out recently from mm -hmm. a few various groups that has sort of shown that there's across the US or across North America, it's, this lag is maybe 6,000 years on average. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm kind of curious as to what your thoughts are how this might vary across um, topographically complex regions mm -hmm. like Northern California, where you have very heterogeneous um, mm -hmm. biogeographic barriers versus more maybe open plain mm -hmm. stuff. And do you mm -hmm. think that the mammal patterns might match the uh, the, the pollen uh, record there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, lags is something I'm really interested in. And I think it's a really different, you know, it. it I think that's a really clever way of looking at it, of maybe making that comparison between the sort of more less topographically complex plains region, where maybe velocity of you know species movement across the landscape is is really quick, and so you would expect low lags or small small lags, short lags, with a more topographically complex area. Um, I um, I think that really to it it is hard to look at lags with small mammal assemblage data from caves because of time averaging, right? And so um, a lot of the um, work that I've done on, you know, trying that is trying to get at a, a finer temporal resolution is with pollen where you have um, better resolved uh, base data. Um, there's still issues of time averaging you need to account for, but I don't think that it's that it's, um, the best system to really look at lags with assemblage data from caves because of the time averaging question. Um, and then the other, so that's just sort of the taphonomic data. I mean, you're nodding your head. This is, you know, you know this. Um, uh, this is something that, you know, we know. Um, the other sort of disconnect, um, I think, ideally, you'd want to, you know, sort of comes down to this, like, what's climate doing regionally and sort of that regional forcing um, climate, you know, glacial interglacial dynamics versus like, what is it doing locally? Um, and we don't have um, really good local climate data. There's some speleothem data from a cave right in the same watershed as Samuel Cave, but it's really just, it's, a, it's this work by um, Jessica Oster at Vanderbilt, but it's really um, disc, a discontinuous record. So we don't have a nice um, climate, you know, sort of continuous climate record, um, which is I think the other piece to the puzzle that I would like. You know, we can work with the um, you know, sedimentary ice core records. Um, so a lot of the climate work I've done is based on an ice uh, uh, ocean core off the coast of Northern California, Southern Oregon. But, um, but that's sort of this other point of disconnect um, that I think would be nice to solve to really get at that lag question. So, so yeah, I guess in terms of so like to follow up on that with the mm -hmm. sort of intersecting the faunal data with the pollen data, and mm -hmm. because at, at a very fine scale, you expect that some of these dynamics mm -hmm. are going to be driven partially by vegetation. Mm -hmm. And so the pollen might, I guess, help answer that in that, in that sense. Yes. Yeah. My lifelong quest. I mean, I have, you know, a history in the pollen, pollen work with uh, Jack Williams and others. And then, you know, my sort of deeper history, more recent history of the small mammals. I really, I, I really want to connect them better. <laughs> it's like my career goal. It is really hard because of these scale differences. Um, that emerge and just the way data are collected. Um, uh, but that that is my personal goal is to try to better connect them. But I think also, you know, especially in the West, 
you get at a spatial disconnect where most of the pollen is coming from natural lakes, which tend to be at much higher elevations. And those high elevations um, tend to have are much wetter environments where you don't get very good preservation of bone. And so there's a little bit of this. So there is a lot of pollen data for that Klamasiski region, but it tends to be from the higher elevation natural lakes. There's a there's a clear lake record at lower elevations, but you get a you know, I, I like topographically complex regions because they're really interesting and important regions, but there's a lot more of those data challenges when you're trying to merge data from different kinds of depositional environments. Great. Yeah. Thank you for <laughs> opining on this. Yes. Great yes. talk again. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. This is the end of the questions. I will give the word now to our vice president for conferences, Crystal. Jessica, thank you so much for a great talk. And thanks to the attendees for staying around and answering, uh, asking some really nice questions. Um, so I'd just like for those of you who are left to bring your attention to two events that we have coming up soon for the IBS. Um, one is here in Amsterdam, which is where I'm based. And so we'll have an early career conference October the 22nd through the 24th of this year. So I hope some of you can make that. And then we have our larger biennial conference in Vancouver, uh, January 8th through the 12th, 2022. So we don't have registration open quite yet for either of these events, but that will be coming soon. But just to kind of put this on your radar for some of our upcoming meetings, where you can see a lot more talks on biogeography and, and patterns and processes in space and time. So Jessica, thanks again. Thank you everybody for coming. Thanks for organizing Karen and Crystal and David. Thank you and thanks everyone for coming.